Hello and welcome to The Extras, where we take you behind the scenes of your favorite TV shows, movies, and animation, and they're released on digital, DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K, or your favorite streaming site. I'm Tim Millard, your host. Today, actor, writer, and producer Dean Butler joins the podcast to talk about his career and his time on the beloved classic TV show, Little House on the Prairie. He played the character of Almanza Wilder, who was the love interest for Laura Ingalls, and eventually becomes her husband. Dean started on the show in season six and was in 65 episodes running through the ninth season, plus three TV movies. He was also a lead in the TV series, The New Gidget, starring Karen Richmond as Gidget, which ran for 44 episodes from 1986 to 88. He has been in dozens of TV series and films and was a producer for the Golf Channel. So we're very privileged today to have him on the podcast. Dean Butler, welcome to The Extras. Thanks, Tim. Nice to be here with you today. Well, this year will mark 40 years. It's kind of amazing. But 40 years since the Little House on the Prairie finale, which I believe was in 1983. Yeah. Um, though you had some, you know, you had some movies, I think, in the year or two after that. But uh, we were talking just uh, in preparation for this podcast, and I was saying, okay, you know, is it available on streaming? You said, yeah, it's available on Peacock, on Prime, on iTunes. And I know, you know, fans can get the Blu-ray and DVD box sets and all the seasons. So it's still extremely popular. So before we dive into a little bit of your experience on the show, why do you think the show has endured for so long? I think Little House has endured uh, the way it has because it touches on themes that are so universally attractive to people. It, it, it obviously stresses family, it stresses community, it stresses goodness, it stresses honesty, it stresses um, those kinds of positive attributes that people have. And, and, they, and we did it, the show did it through, you know, through telling stories that revealed the problems that can result from misbehavior and did it in a very lovely way. You know, it's the show was unabashedly emotional. It was unabashedly sentimental. No, no one, you know, no one who loved the show was going to be surprised to see people crying in every, you know, in, in every episode. Um, and so it just, it, it was something that, became part of people's family. Right. You know, I, I think that's, I think that's, we see that now through the years. And for me, it's been, for, this is now my 43rd year associated with the series, actually starting the 44th year. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, this is the kind of thing that people come back to with the show again and again and again. I think they, I think that also to so many people, Tim feels safe. Right. Uh, it feels like, you know, what you're, you always know what you're going to get. Anybody can sit down in front of this program, any age from child to senior citizen. And there's something for you in every episode. And um, that was one of Michael's goals in, making the program is he, he wanted to make television that families could sit down and watch together and have conversations about together on a multi-generational basis, as opposed to the world we find ourselves in today, where, you know, dad's watching one thing in one room and mom's watching something somewhere else. And multiple kids are watching different things on their multiple devices. Right. And so other than the huge live events yeah. that we have in our culture, we're not getting that water, those water cooler moments mm -hmm. as we like to talk about years ago, where there was a shared experience that America had. And we weren't all, we weren't all having the same shared experience. We were what, but, but we were watching we were watching fewer things. More of us were watching fewer things that allowed for a commonality of experience in the culture. And I think there's value in that. And that we don't have anymore. We've given that up for something else. And only time will tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, it's 
it, you're so right on the money in terms of the family watching. That's how our family did it. I mean, my, my mother, just to give a little background for the listeners, but my mother was a huge fan of the show and she, she kind of brought the rest of the family into it. And that's because it really related to her family history. Sure. And I think there's a lot of people in the Midwest, you know, of course, that it, it did as well. Her mother literally was born in um, Mankato, which you could drive easily to Walnut Grove area sure. from Mankato. And she was born in That's 1900. About 40, about 40 minutes, I think. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And she was born in 1900. So uh, my, mm -hmm. my grandmother. So she was a little, maybe a decade after, you know, the series or so. But that's still close enough that she felt a real affinity to the lifestyle that that kind of on the farm, small town, Minnesota. So she really like grasped onto the show because of of her own memories of her, of her grandparents and her parents. Yeah. And uh, they eventually moved a little bit north Minnesota, but same thing, living on a farm and everything. So she brought it in. Our whole family, we watched together. And you look at the ratings from those years. I mean, it was a perennial top show yeah so it, it was really popular throughout america for all those years so but here's the thing my mom has passed now yeah you know a lot of that generation is gone but the show i i mean i remember it affectionately fondly watching it and you know we just gathered around we as you say it could lead to discussions it could lead to you know topical things but it also had just the ease of it was never going to offend anybody and parents right. never had to worry about what their kids were going to see in it. So it's always right. great for that. I think, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the episode where we had the uh, Sylvia with the clown rapist or the, you know, uh, I think that's, that's sort of one that pushed the boundaries of what Little House was. Now, Michael was a huge horror fan. Um. And so he did this episode that of all the episodes I think of, and I wasn't, I wasn't in Sylvia, but, you know, maybe I was sitting in church at one point, but, you know, it, uh, um, that's the one that I think gives people pause when they, when they think, and it's, you know, out of 200 and something episodes or, you know, one to one or two to really grab an audience, grab an audience or make them say, wow, that's, that's a little different. You know, that's, that's pretty good. It's pretty know, good. Michael had a need to express himself in a particular way. And, um, it was compelling. It was powerful, but wow, a little different. Right. For a little yeah. Well, that, that, I think that's a good segue into, into kind of asking you, I mean, you came in in season six of the show. I'm sure you knew about it. You were a young actor and how could you not know about little house in the prairie? What are your memories of kind of um, maybe your agent or manager brought it to your attention? And tell us a little bit about how you actually got involved with the show. So the first part of your question, other than knowing that it existed, because yes, when you're a young actor in the community, you, you sort of have to, you have to make it your business to sort of, to know what's out there and have a sense of what you might be castable in. Um, but I had never watched a full episode of it. You know, it, at that point in time, it, it premiered on Wednesday nights by the time I, and that was 1974, I was just graduating from high school and going off to college. You know, I wasn't sitting in front of the television on Wednesday night at eight o'clock watching Little House on the Prairie. When it moved to Monday night, it was in direct competition with the, this, with the second half of a Monday night football game on ABC. Right. So I wasn't watching it then. What really, what, when this, when the meeting came up, my agent at the time was a woman named Ina Bernstein. And Ina was one of the grand dames of ICM during that era. She was, she was the number, she was ICM's top television agent. Um, I was very fortunate to be signed by her after doing a movie of the week with one of her clients, Stephanie Zimblis. The movie of the week was called Forever, based on the Judy Bloom novel, which is now being remade as a series. But Ina was a huge Little House fan. And she said to me when this interview came up, she said, if you get this, you will do this show. 
This is one of this is one of the best shows on television. I cry every week when I watch it. And this was, you know, this was a sentimental woman, but you know, nobody's fool. She was, you know, she was a serious minded person and a very accomplished businesswoman. I mean, way ahead of the curve in her era in terms of what she had accomplished. Little House, she loved Michael, she loved the kids, she loved everybody. And so when this happened, she was, I mean, no one could have been happier about it than Ina was. Um, but had she not really emphatically told me that this is something that you, you know, how age, agents can be, that they tell you this is something you want to do, or we want to do this, we don't want to do this. Right. So it's sort of we, you know. Sure. So we we don't want to. We we do. Little House was something she we definitely wanted to do. So. I was knocked out after getting it, and there was a long process of a long process of auditioning for it in the spring of 1979. Multiple meetings and back and forth. I was going still in college at that point. I was going to the University of the Pacific up in Stockton. I was commuting down to Los Angeles to do these auditions, um, and you know when it finally happened, it happened like two weeks before graduation. And uh, I went through graduation, celebrated my 23rd birthday and reported to work on Monday, you know, the Monday wow. after that. It was an amazing, it was just an incredible, fortuitous, you know, memorable for me series of events. So uh, I was just knocked out by the size of it, Tim. I'd done some small things. I'd seen, you know, obviously seen production units, seen honey wagons, seen camera trucks, seen... But, you know, with Little House, you arrived, I arrived in Simi Valley on that first day and went up the road in the, in a van and arrived at the Little House set. And there were, there were 20 trucks and it was, you know, 20, 25 trucks. And it was everything from, you know, makeup and hair and wardrobe, camera, audio, lighting, animals, wagons, you know, all of these things that you had to have in order to make this, bring this world to life. And it was just like this, at the little house, this parking lot of all of this logistics, including uh, the thing I never forget is the, is the big Blue Max bus, everyone called it the Blue Max, that had this huge banner on the side of it you know, watch Little House Monday nights at eight on NBC. And I thought, oh my God, I've, you know, I've, I've arrived here. Sure. And I was just, I was knocked out by the sheer size of it. And then contrast that when you have all of these bodies and all of this equipment and all of this stuff, and then you're pointing the camera at these intimate, beautiful little moments that are happening between people that are so everyday type stuff. There was nothing huge about it. Mm -hmm. It was, it was very, very simple and intimate and honest. And it took all of these people and all of this equipment to drill down and create those frames that were these beautiful, simple things. And then you had David Rose on a scoring stage writing this beautiful orchestral music that was giving every character this massive emotional life, this beautiful, rich, textured, romantic emotional life. And I just think the combination of that, you know, all those, those ingredients coming together just made the show, if you got it, and not everyone got it, clearly. But if you got it, it, you were hooked, and you were you were going to be there watching that for a long time. I remember Michael said to me one time, "I know I'm not. I know what we're doing isn't for everybody, but I know there are a ton of, of people out there for whom what I'm doing is everything." Right. And you know, so he was very confident about his job security. You know, and, and that's, you know, a series television goes. I mean, if, if you, you know, if you get three seasons, you've gotten an eternity. Yeah. 
you know, so Michael had three eternities with Little House and, <laughs> right. and you know, and five eternities with Bonanza and yeah. two plus eternities with Highway to Heaven. Right. He, Michael was a, you know, Michael was a massively huge presence in television. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, going back to Bonanza just real quickly, I mean, I remember going to see my grandpa, you know, he had retired by that time. He had like 20 acres and he would go out there. He had some cows and other things like that. This is down in Bend, Oregon. And we, I would go down the summertime and he would work us, you know, he'd try to teach us things, you know, as uh, as young men. Sure. But uh, when it came time for Bonanza reruns to be on at two or three in the afternoon, that was it. Work was over wow. <laughs> for at least the length of the program. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, those are good memories for any kid to be with sure. your grandpa. And sure. of course, I loved it, not only because it was a great show, but I got a break from whatever he was making me do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, but good memories. But speaking of Michael Landon, did you, he was an executive producer on the show. Did you end up reading for him before your cast? And then what were yes. some of your experiences with him? Yeah, no, I ultimately, Michael was the last set of eyes that was on anybody that was cat. I mean, certainly in a part that size, I think there are, you know, guest cast, although I think Michael looked at it, you know, Michael yeah. met everybody, he probably you know, did, he, yeah. he, he, he really did. But my meetings with him, I had one meeting with him where the casting decision was made. Uh, the previous meetings had all been with Susan Sukman, who became Susan Sukman McRae, who cast the show, I think from, I want to say from like season three to the end. Um, and Susie had a lovely way of dealing with actors. You know, she just made people feel instantly comfortable coming into the room. She was, she was sort of, she was nothing like other casting directors I had met. She was just sweet and warm and funny and, interested and, you know, really, really truly looking for ways to see you succeed. If you could succeed, she was going to help you get there. Doesn't mean you were going to get the job, but she was going to do everything she could do to give you the best chance to present yourself in a way that was going to be what she knew Michael was looking for. Right. I, 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 I always remember Tim coming into the office the first time and finding a stack of pictures a foot tall on her desk. And the second time I came back, it was six inches tall. And the third time I came back, it was two inches tall. And the last time I came back to read for Michael, there were four pictures on the desk. Now, I never saw any of the pictures, but I knew I was in there somewhere. Right. And um, And at the end of that meeting, after that reading, he asked me what I was doing at the end of May. So wow. um, now it took them two weeks to make an offer. I was just about like, you know, ready to slit my wrist because it was taking so long. And I was back at school and completely unable to focus and concentrate because, you know, I'd had this happen to me before <clears throat> where someone had basically cast me in the room and then it didn't work out. And so I had that scab mm -hmm. on me. And so I was, you know, everything I'd ever heard about this guy said, he just wouldn't do that. You know, he wouldn't say that if he didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. But um, they had their timing on what they were doing. And I had my timing, they had theirs and their timing went out and it took them two weeks to make an offer. And I was calling every, probably I was calling Ina Bernstein four times a day saying, you know, what's going on. And I'm sure she was working the phones to the extent to be, to be present, but not pushy. <clears throat> you never want to appear desperate. Um, but it was, you know, it was quite a time. Um, Michael was, you know, you asked about what was Michael, he was a wonderful, wonderful director, and he was great to act with in a scene because he was very present. You could look into his eyes and you knew he was there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when he wasn't working, he always had Carrera sunglasses on. So you really couldn't see his eyes when he was directing. Right. 
But when you were acting, and, and that's not always true. I mean, on the stage, sure, he, you know, it was dark, and he, but he he wore other glasses. Um, he had these big round, sort of, you know, um, big round glasses that he wore. They weren't round, but sort of square glasses. Um, and then this, the Carreras outside, and so he had a, a little bit of a shield in front of him, but he could watch you very closely. You always knew. And, you know, this was before the days of video assist. So, you know, there was no gather people. No one was gathering around monitors, watching a performance or watching a playback or anything like that. Michael was right next to the lens when he was directing. He was always right next to the lens and he was watching very carefully. And, you know, you knew, you knew if you got it, and you knew if you were going to do another one and you knew it right away. And um, he was really masterful at sort of knowing, knowing when to stop. And, you know, frequently he got what he was looking for on one, one or two takes. And you really needed to just trust him that when he, when he said print, he meant it and he got it. And there was no, there was no need to do any more. And um, I think as a, as a young, insecure actor, you're always thinking, oh, my God, I could have done that better. But you had to learn to resist the temptation to ask, can I have another one? Right. Because he knew. And if he got it, there were no more. He was moving on because he was shooting seven and a half pages a day. And and he did it between eight o'clock in the morning and four thirty in the afternoon, or five at the latest, every day mm-hmm. for five days a week. Right. And he didn't mess around. Right. You yeah. know, it was business. It was. Yeah. He kept it light. He kept it fun. It was always loose. There was, you know, were very few tense moments on that set that I can never remember. I mean, people were laughing, people relaxed, because they trusted him and they knew that he knew. And, you know, so it was a really great set to work on. And he and our producer, Kent McRae, made it that way. Right. You know, they, they just had this, they exuded a level of confidence that, that just communicated to everybody, we got this. Right. This is, we're, we're golden, we're good, we have no issues. And I think people, and that was such a gift. That was a real gift. And and because you came on really at the sixth season, it was a bit of a well-oiled machine by then. Totally. Because well-oiled. if you, you know, I just recently, you know, before our conversation, reviewed a few episodes and there's kids, there's dogs, there's horses, there, you know, there's a lot of logistics yeah, yeah. in any one scene sometimes. You got a schoolhouse scene and we'll, we'll get into this, uh, this first episode actually that you were in, um, Back to school, part one. In that yes. episode, there's what fifteen kids in this schoolhouse in one town, and then Laura goes to another town. There's another bunch of young people, so you've got to work with a lot of kids. You've got you driving the horse and buggy, and I mean, there's a lot of animals and and things like that. So, but by season six, they had it down. So yeah, no, I think, and I and I have a sense that because Michael's crew had been with him since Bonanza, I and mean, he, you know, he oh, kept yeah. these people together they came into this as a well-oiled machine. I, I, I'd be very surprised if there was any hiccup at any stage of this. I think they came into it well-oiled um, and greased and the shows just worked. Right. And Michael knew because of 14 years of Bonanza, he knew how to make television Sure, sure. of that era. Now he wouldn't, you know, If you were making television today and Michael, you know, has been gone for 31 years, he was 54, he would have been 85 now. Um, If he were still making television, which would just be amazing if he could have done that, you know, television would be very, would be demanding in a very different way today in terms of the, the look of it, the amount of coverage that's required to give it this cinematic look. And I don't, you know, I, I I think, look, Michael was a brilliant guy. I think he could have adapted, I think, but he knew how he wanted to make things. Sure. Yeah. No, well, he absolutely knew. 
let's talk about that that first episode. I mean, you got the audition, you you got the part, and as you mentioned, I mean, this was this was going to be a multi season role potentially as the love interest to basically the main character of the books and and then also of the series. So it's an important character. What do you recall of that first episode kind of stepping on uh, other than it was a large production, but were you nervous? Were you? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. About that? Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. 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 You see, you know, and the thing is, Tim, I didn't I had not read the books, so I didn't really understand what was coming here. Oh, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I knew that. You know, I, I knew it was an important part. I knew this was he was going to be her love interest. I knew, you know, I knew that. But what I didn't know was <clears throat> the scale or the the scope of the fandom, right, <laughs> that surrounded this, and that people really, you know, you were dealing with generations of people who had been reading these books already. I mean, they had started to be published in 1931. That character Valmanzo was introduced to the reading audience by 1933 uh, in her second book, Farmer Boy. And he's nine years old at that point. And then, of course, as the books keep coming out. We see him again and she presents him in a very particular way, which all leading to these happy golden years where the relationship really blossoms and they get married. Um, and that's the end of the series as she envisioned it. Well, I was going to ask you uh, along those lines, like, how much did you feel some of the expectation and external oh pressure my God, from the yeah. fans? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you got me back on track here. Yeah, I, d- I did have those moments thinking, and this is, you know, this is sort of, you know, actor narcissism, thinking that, you know, that what would I do that could screw this up? <laughs> you know, that would wreck it. And um, Michael was never going to let anybody wreck anything. Sure, right. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if you were, even if you were having a bad day, you know, he, he was going to help you make it work. And um, you couldn't have every day be a bad day, but you could have some bad days. Sure. And, or tough moments and scenes. And he would, you know, he'd help you through. So I think that, but you know, when you're, when you're the actor, and it's sort of, you know, it's sort of always all about you sure. when, when you're, when you're the actor and it's sort of, that's a bit of a cliche, but it's, yeah. you know, I think it's, I think there's a certain truth, which is why sure. cliches are always have a certain amount of truth to them uh, or a lot of truth. Right. So, you know, there, we're all sort of myopically focused on ourselves. And I think the people who do this best are people who get off of themselves and focus on everybody else. And trust that they're okay, right. and that they don't have to worry about themselves. They're focusing on what everybody else is doing and giving their best to those people, but not being fixated on their own results. And I think that I think people are blessed with that. If you know, if you have that as an actor, what a gift you are to everybody you're working with, because you're focused on the right things. You're focused on you're focused on the team. You're focused on the process. You obviously have to know your dialogue and you have to come in ready to bring the best of yourself. But the fo- trusting yourself and giving all of your energy to others is really, you know, an important piece of this. And that takes some time to learn that. Now, some people maybe just walk in with that. And if they do, they are really the lucky ones. Uh, I think for most people, it takes some time to learn that. You know, so, to, so for yeah. you, I take it that that's where you were at. You were you were just oh. kind of focused on yourself there. Oh, so you, I was you, just my yeah. Am I, am I going to do this right? <laughs> am I going to say the lines right? Am right. I going to am I going to you know am I going to stumble? Am I going to say something stupid? Am I going to look bad? Am I you know all of these demons that you've got spinning in your head? Oh yeah, I had all of that going on. So, so I mean, it's been 40 years or, or actually more since, uh, since that first episode, but I mean, I rewatched it because again, it's available on streaming and I guess, you know, it's been years since I'd seen it, but I couldn't help but saying there's, there's Dean's smile. I mean, no. all you had to do to some extent to get the likability across was your smile, right? I mean, to a certain there's- extent, I've, I've, you've probably been told that, but you flash yeah. that smile 
And yeah. as a viewer, you're like, this is a likable character. I'm going to like this guy, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. unless yeah. you're bringing some I really do. heavy expectation, I suppose. But right. right. <laughs> I think you hit a very, I think you hit a very key point that's sort of one of the part of the secret sauce of all of this and why I mean, y- casting directors, producers, directors have a huge pool of talent to pick from when they're casting something. And they just have to be patient enough for that person to walk in the door that says to them, that's it. Right. And that decision gets made in about eight seconds. And, you know, you could have a lot of people read well and they, you know, whatever, they've got a nice quality and, you know, they, they, they're intelligent and they, they bring all the stuff, but, there's this intangible thing that we as hu- each of us own something. You know, we own, we are all unique. And if we allow ourselves to be unique or allow ourselves to be ourselves, we are in the best position to bring that special something in the door. Right. <clears throat> it's when you're thinking about what do I need to do to be special that I think is just a, a complete loser of a position to be in. You're not, a, you're not authentic then is the, is the thing, right? As an actor, yeah, you're not authentic. You're not authentic. Yeah, I know. Actor. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think you, you have to be present and in the moment. So for, for me that, you know, as you say that smile or whatever, you know, whatever that is, that combination of things, um, I think that that has been or was for me as an actor, the thing that people wanted right. from me. Yeah. You know, that they, they weren't looking for, and of course I wanted it to be complex and brooding and challenging. And, you know, I wanted it to be all these, you know, I wanted to be all these different things. What people were hiring me wanted was me for, for me just to be an affable, good guy. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> that was, you know, that was sort of hard for me to wrap. That was hard for me to wrap my head around because I thought, well, I have to be so much more than that. And the answer was, no, I didn't have to be anything more than that. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, so live and learn, Yeah. you know, live and learn. Well, with that, um, the other things that I noticed is, you know, obviously you watch that episode and, uh, Melissa Gilbert, she's pretty young and she's quite a bit younger than you. Yeah. And in that and episode, smaller and a yeah, lot smaller. Smaller. yeah, cause you're, how tall are you? You're pretty tall. Uh, I, you know, at that point I was probably six one. Okay. So I'm a little shorter now, but okay. I, but I, you know, she, but she, I, tall she? I, and, and Melissa was probably five, four. Right. Yeah. There's a large difference, but not only that, the age difference between yes. she was what, 15 at the time. 15 and I was 23. Yeah. So just that maturity level of, of the look. And even huge the, difference. And even in the episode, they start her off. She's running to school with her, you know, brother and all the other younger kids. So they really highlight the fact that she's still a little girl in many ways. And over the course of that episode, she meets you. A lot of things happen. And it's like between the beginning of that episode, and the end of that episode, the maturity that mm. her character kind of arcs mm. pretty tremendous. And that sets mm. what is going to happen, of course, in the season. Mm. But um, talk about meeting her, Melissa, for the first time and what that was like with the age difference. The, you know, interestingly, today, I think if you were doing that kind of a casting, forget the age difference between us, because that's a whole other thing. But, you know, you would generally do mix and match sessions with actors and you would, you know, you'd bring in the character that the actress or the actor that is the person on the show. And then that actor or actress would read with a group of people that producers had decided were the possible candidates for this job. Michael never did any of that. There was no mixing and matching. Michael cast, I mean, he did the mix and match in his head and he just made the decision in, with all these characters, these people are going to work and they're going to work with each other. I feel it. I know it. He had great faith in that. So 
I didn't meet Melissa until the until that first day of shooting. I obviously knew who she was. You you would have to have been deaf, dumb, and blind in America to not know who she was at that point. But <clears throat> she really was a little girl when she walked into the room. I was in the makeup trailer, you know, that first day, sipping on a cup of coffee and in she comes and with this one of her little calico dresses on and the pigtails and all that. And and I looked at her and, you know, to myself, I'm thinking, wow, she really is a kid. She's a little, she's a, she's really, she, there was no sign of young woman on her at all. It's just like, there just wasn't any evidence of that, you know? So I'm thinking, wow, this is really, this is really going to be interesting to see how this develops. Now, the other part of that that you mentioned, I mean, so, okay, so we're very, but the age difference, that eight year age difference at that age is massive. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 to 23, you're living in different worlds completely. And so, you know, we had, other than the fact that we were, you know, both human beings and we were both here in this situation, we had very little life experience in common. Um, We had, you know, okay, there are cultural references, sort of the big cultural references that you, everybody knows that you have in common. I can't think of what any of those were right now, but, you know, you have that. We spoke the same language, you know. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you are Canadian. So that that <laughs> helps. But in, in terms of looking at her and seeing that there was some basis for some kind of relationship here, beyond, uh, you know, a little kid that you wave to on the street or on the, on the dirt road, you know, you just wouldn't have thought there was anything like that. And when this all started, and of course, people, so many of our audience had read the books and knew the books, and they knew when they met this character, they knew where this was going and mm-hmm. immediately. I mean, they knew that the character was coming. I think that that had been, I think that the promotion for the season had sort of tipped that off. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Um, but no one had seen me yet. And we got letters from mothers around the country saying, what are you doing? How could you put this man with this little girl? What message are you sending? What, how am I supposed to communicate this to my adolescent daughter who is ogling someone older? How do I tell her that's not appropriate when you're doing this? And I think it was an, it was an interesting dilemma. And it, you know, I think Michael, I think it was part of why it was part of why he cast me. I'm a I was a was and am a very well behaved man. I, I was raised to have an enormous amount of respect for women. Um, I was I, I like women. You know, I, I was raised to like women and trust women, and have a, an a, an abundant level of respect for women. So, you know, I knew how to behave. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a question. I just don't think today, if you flash forward, so we did this in 1979. Today, with everything that's gone on in our culture, there's no way you could do that casting today. That that would be an absolute impossibility to do that casting today, I I think. Now, someone may disagree and say, oh, no, no, we could do that. And here's how we do it. But I just think audiences now the good news is that we don't have the mass audiences that we used to have these are very niche audiences today so you wouldn't be offending perhaps as many people <laughs> but um I, I think there could be a, there could be a real problem with that with our casting today I, I just think it would never never happen what what you just said that kind of is shocking is that you hadn't met her until that first day of filming, which just right. from an industry perspective sounds mind-boggling in a little way. But very and, common. 
that part of it's common. Yeah. Okay. You know? But, but for least, something that's as important as this, yeah, that's in terms amazing. of the trajectory of a right. of a whole program, yeah, to not read together or anything, you know, Nothing. yeah, and it, you know, now Tim, I, I, I think I would say this. I think if I had met her beforehand, if they put us in a room together, I would not have been cast because mm -hmm. I think she would have absolutely had a fit. Okay, I, I think it would have been a disaster for her if she had met me in a casting situation. I mean, she okay. might've liked me personally, but you know, if you've read her book and she wrote a whole, she wrote a whole chapter about this. Um, she was completely overwhelmed and repelled because of her lack of experience. She knew that she and I had, she knew that we had nothing in common. And so I think she, now to her credit, and I've always said this to her, she gave no indication that she was anything but totally confident and okay with this situation. It took years later to discover how absolutely flipped out she was by this pairing. And I don't know what she ever said to Michael. I don't, I don't know. Right. Um, I think I have to ask her that. Yeah. Um, you know, did she ever approach him about this? Something tells me that she probably didn't, but she had the kind of relationship with him where she could have. Mm -hmm. Well, know, that was an exceptional relationship that she had with him. Well, knowing what you've just said about Michael and his instincts, yes, it feels like maybe that was not accidental that he knew that, you yeah. know what? I think we'll just go this way and, yeah. you know, that he knew what he was doing as yeah. a director, producer. Right. No, I actor. think you're right, Tim. Yeah. I mean, he just like, yeah, we're just going to, once he's there, that's it. Yeah. But if I get all this resistance going into the, going into the situation, that will be hard to overcome. So yeah, he, he just didn't even give her the opportunity to object. Right. Well, I think I've read online too, where you've talked about this and you talk about her mother as well. Oh my God. Being well, just like, Barbara, yeah. Oh, I mean, it was as, as the, well, that was later in the, 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 the situation later in the year with this episode, sweet 16, where the first kiss happened. Right. I think Let's that's what Barbara's that. presence that. on the set was really felt when she, when she cried out before the kiss, the, before the kiss could happen. I don't think she was looking to wreck the take, but she did. Oh, and wow. she wrecked like four takes in a row because she just couldn't bear to see her. She was just flipped out seeing her young daughter in this situation, um, you know, having to do this kiss. And this was her, this was her first kiss of someone other than someone that didn't have to kiss her, uh, you know, or, or a parental figure or familial figure in her life. So this was, this was, uh, this was a big deal for her. Um, well, I, I watched she, it. She cried endlessly. Barbara was just, she had to be asked to like, she had to be finally asked, you've got to get a grip on yourself. Oh, wow. You can't keep doing this. Well, how did Melissa react? Well, I think she was totally, she was horrified that, that her, that her mother would, behave this way. She just wanted, I think, you know, hearing about reading about this later, she just wanted to get out of there okay. after this was done. She couldn't wait for it to be over. Yeah. Because please someone take me home right. and get me away from all this. Yeah. I and mean, it, I think it, that was not a fun day for her. Right. Um, well, I tell you what, you guys were professionals because I rewatched it and it looks very natural. There's, it, it doesn't, I mean, obviously I just kind of skipped right to that episode, you know, before we talked here to, to remind right. myself what, what that was like. Yeah. And it's very kind of low key. It's very sweet. Yeah. It's very sweet. Very low it's key. It's sweet. It's innocent. It's in the moment. All that. I, I felt like I had to be younger than she was in that scene uh. because not that, a young man in that period of time is going to have a whole lot of life experience outside of, you know, a few kisses. 
But, you know, this was, I felt like in order to make this okay, I've got to be younger than she is in my, it's got to be as awkward or more awkward for me than it is for her. Uh, That was just, that was, that was my take on it in order to have it not be something that would, could in any way look or feel lascivious or taking advantage or, you know, any of that. And I think that, I think that was Michael's, that was probably Michael's, one of the things that he watched most closely was to just make sure that we were playing this so, so straight and so underplaying all of it and Mm -hmm. keeping it, keeping it just really, really innocent. That was a, that was a big deal. You know, I've often thought, Tim, it would have been great if, you know, if, 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 if Melissa had been three years older, if she'd been, if she'd been 18 and had a little life experience had some dates, had a couple of boyfriends or a boyfriend or whatever, so that this was not completely, but that wouldn't have been what it was. Right. You know, it might've been easier for us to work together because we would have had something more in common, but it wouldn't have necessarily been good for the show. Sure. You know, you, there could never be any kind of Harlequin novel quality about this, Right. it had to be chaste and pure and, that's what we got. Right. Wow. And in looking at it in that sense, I think that, you know, Michael's instincts were, were terrific and we all served those instincts. And, um, and I think one of the reasons that people love it so much without question is because of that innocence and that sweetness. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, looking back at that season, things happened fairly rapidly from the first episode to the sweet Sixteen. Yeah. And then really by the beginning, is, is it right at pretty much at the beginning of season seven that you guys actually in the show get married? Yeah. I think that's, I mean, uh, we're talking, that I think it's, Do we get married at the, do we even get married two. at the end of that season? No, I think I read that it was season seven, episode two, that you guys okay. get married. But okay. the point is, that is that. Laura in, Ingalls, yeah, it was Laura Ingalls Wilder was the name of the episode. Yeah, Laura Ingalls Wilder part two. Right. And right. I mean, I think that from a, you know, obviously in TV time, that could be more than a year, but in people's real life, that was only within a year of watching, so to speak, one season of TV, television, yeah, yeah. 24 episodes or whatever that was, 26. 22, yeah. Yeah. 22 and um, so this moved the audience very quickly from, you know, the the young little half pint I know. to I know. a married woman. I mean, and yeah, yeah. So that, was, that was fast. That was a lot for people to take in. But it also kept the story and the audience, you know, moving along, and I, which I yeah, think yeah. is important probably for a show that's in its sixth, seventh season, you're starting to get maturity and fans can start to drop off a little bit. So you got to keep the interest there. Yeah, and, no, it's true. <laughs> it's well, true. What are some of your other favorite, uh, or if it could be either a favorite or memorable, but outside of the few that we just mentioned, uh, when you look back on the series? There was, there was an episode called... Uh, uh, there was an episode called The Nephews, where which was not an audience favorite, but I loved it. It was when my older brother's two children, two boys, come to stay with us, and they're just hellraisers. They're just they're just complete pranksters and wise guys, and yeah. you know, and they just work Uncle Monzo uh, relentlessly for this hour, right. you know, and every conceivable practical joke that they can do to uh to rattle uncle monzo they do and you know finally laura sort of you know being the world wise person that she was at that point uh she uh you know she sort of straightens them out and lets them know that we're not going to take this anymore and that there there are going to be consequences for your bad behavior (laughs) so uh but it was you know it was fun it was it was it was high energy. The kids were lovely. They, you know, the little boy, one of the little boys was the young actor who did the great scene in airplane with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the cockpit of the airplane. Yeah. Huh. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was so terrific in in that scene. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and he was, he and his fellow nephew were, uh, were little hell raisers. That's great. They were, they were great. They were great. So that one I really loved. Um, 
an episode uh, later, well, an episode called Divorce Walnut Grove Style, which was very early on after the after the wedding where, you know, the glow comes off this moment and we get to see some problems and, uh, <clears throat> and, and you know, Laura thinks that Almanzo is being unfaithful with this, you know, singing a song called My Only Love, which he's wanting to sing for her, but I don't know, you know, so, you know, there are the, all those kinds of things that went on. Later on, there was an episode called a two part episode called Days of Sunshine, Days of Shadow, where and it was really an episode that they did to see if they they wanted to see if we could carry something. The two of us could carry something that would lead to a ninth season Mm -hmm. because Michael was getting ready to step away. And so they loaded up this episode with every calamity that we could possibly have. Right. And you know, hailstorms and a stroke. I had a stroke and okay, diphtheria yeah. and, you know, all this, so much happened in that. And it was a one of the, it was the wonderful acting challenge of the time that I had on the show to play these different conditions and try and, <clears throat> you know, try and find a way to make all that work. And, and it was that was great fun. It wasn't a it wasn't a happy episode, but it was a really satisfying episode to do. But you know, when you look at the totality of this, Tim, you know, so many good things yeah. in in this show. And the audience love and affection that has come that came at me during that time and in the years, all the years since, has been really in it, this incredible gift. It's mm-hmm. just it's just been amazing. I mean, the show really spoke to people and it continues to speak to people. Do you um, have the opportunity to see any of the the folks that uh, that you worked with back in those days? Uh, oh, I, sure. I know there's things like the Hollywood show here in LA and other yeah. places. There where are groups of us that do a lot of traveling around the country to okay. do events together. Right. So, you know, we don't see everybody because you can't have everybody there. But no, we're a pretty, you know, we are, we're, we stay pretty close. We, I think we all know that we're part of something that's bigger than all of us. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of respect that comes from that, that, and I, I think that we look to, you know, we've looked to take care of it and nurture it, particularly in, you know, and that that's with the 50th anniversary coming in 2024. Um you know, that's, that's a big moment, yeah. I think, you know, to celebrate 50 years of Little House is going to be, uh, you know, pretty great thing. Well, maybe we should talk about that. I mean, as do you already know, or how are you guys talking about things you're going to be doing? Or is that, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about different things that are going to go on. We think, you know, we think that they're going to be a pretty good number size of events that year. Um, we're we're looking at you know we're looking at different things that are going to happen. But look, you know, we, there's we don't know, right. but we know that you know. But fans, you know, I think that the I think that the Laura Ingalls Wilder book community, which is really drives all of these sites in the Midwest, um, you know, they want to give people an opportunity to. Uh, have a moment and we have to make it, we, you know, we have to figure out what's going to make it special in the 50th makes it special all by itself, but we have to make it special for people, right. you know, to come out and celebrate with us. Well, are you, are you personally going to do anything kind of looking toward that 50th? Well, I'm looking, um, I'm working on a, uh, I'm working on a literary project now. <laughs> um, I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning, working on this literary project, getting up every day at five to, you know, to begin to um, advance this narrative. And it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be part memoir, part look back at 50 years of Little House. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it will have a, it will have a strong Little House foundation Mm -hmm. in it. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And I think, 
you know, to have an opportunity to make a statement about the 50 years that if we package it properly, it can become sort of a defining, a defining statement about 50 years. And I, you know, I, I started thinking about a book in 2021 and um, as the pandemic was going on and then it became more real in 2022. And then, you know, last year I really actively started working on it. It would have been really great if I'd really actively started working on it in 2021, but, (laughs) you know, but I, but I do have a hard deadline now. And uh, I, you know, uh, there's going to be, you know, there's a, there's a word count and a proposal and a, you know, and all of this and a, and a, and a deal with a publisher. And so there will be a book. Okay. Well, there will be a book. That yeah. sounds, I, you know, Hey, look, I, you and I aren't doing this podcast because it's related to any date or event. We met at, at the, uh, at Herbie's book signing Right. And Herbie you were Jay Pilato, Herbie Jay Pilato, one, of the, yeah. one of the great names. Yeah. Yes. And, and Herbie and I, of course, we did a episode on the $6 million man and, and listeners who haven't checked that out should go through our, uh, our catalog and, and listen to that podcast. It's great. But it, I was pleasantly surprised to hear about this uh, writing project of your own. So I'm looking forward to it. And it hadn't even dawned on me that next year is the 50th or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. maybe we'll, uh, I'll be giving you a ring. <laughs> So we could talk about I, that. I hope you, time. I hope you will. Yeah. I hope you will. I mean, hopefully, yeah. hopefully the studio will maybe, um, I mean, there's a good Blu-ray out there. I think, uh, there's a lot of good options for the home entertainment audience, but maybe we'll, I'll keep an ear out as well to see if the, uh, the studio behind the home entertainment release, I think it's Lionsgate, um, if they'll be doing anything new for that as well. So, well, Dean, it was, yeah. this hour has flown by. I can't believe it's it's coming up yeah. on an hour yeah. of our discussion. But, uh, yeah. man, it's a real pleasure to have you on today. Uh, it, it was really fun to talk about Little House on the Prairie. And you know what? I was going to ask you questions about a couple other 80s shows, which I love that you did. You did three episodes of The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. You did a couple yes. episodes. Like, yes. I, did, I, we, I mean, you know, everyone did those shows. Yeah. In that I love those shows for that reason. It's like you would tune in. Who's this week's guest star? There would always be what three or four guest stars per episode. Uh, more, more. I more. think. I think there were probably eight or ten guest stars. Yeah. Per show. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are so iconic of that era, um, and you know, it's it's fun to watch those and just all of the stars that would rotate through those yeah. shows. And then you also you had a whole series. Uh, 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 you were a lead on the New Gidget with Karen Richmond back uh, in eighty six to eighty eight. We didn't talk about that. You you played on Buffy the Vampire Slayer too. I see Buffy's um, dad, right? Yeah. So you've Buffy's had quite dad. the career. I know today we were just primarily talking about uh, Little House and the Prairie, but uh, I did want the listeners to know about some of the other stuff. And it would have been fun to ask you a little bit about those. But we're, we're kind of running Next up against time. it. Yeah, yeah. Next time. Yeah. So well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Tim, for having me. <laughs>